Alright, so I'm a bit late to the party on this one, but ever since pre-ordering this game, I knew that I wanted... No, needed to do a video on it. But, you know, life happens and I didn't get to play it until later because life got in the way. Moving to another state and maintaining an at the time dying YouTube channel tends to do that. And by the way, thank you so much Patreon supporters, you literally let this channel live during the adpocalypse. But now, to this game. I don't think it's necessarily too late to make a video on it since it recently was announced that it is getting a TV show made, and it has some big story DLC coming out, so that's cool. Plus, on the positive side, making a video on a game like this later means that more of you will have already played it, so I don't have to worry about spoiling too much. By the way, spoilers. But what is the point of this video? There are already forums upon forums and video after video explaining various theories surrounding the ending of this game. After all, the game has no dialogue and tells its story through the environment, meaning you have to piece it all together yourself, or let someone else do it for you and post a video about it. And yes, this video is just another video on that subject, though in my research I haven't found anyone else come to this particular conclusion. So I'd like to take a bit of a spin on it, and rather than just explaining the ending, let's explain the whole story, and let's explain, specifically, the whole purpose of the Maw. And before delving right into it, I should bring up a bit of game design, or even a story writing method. In a game with no dialogue, the world tells the story, so everything placed in the world is there for a reason. Be it to further the atmosphere, or to tell a part of the story. And often to help get that story told, you use things that are well known, at least somewhat. These are called tropes, and in mystery games and stories like this one, oftentimes you can't exactly apply any actual evidence or logic to explain something, you just have to look at the trope that's being used or hinted at. And the reason I'm explaining this will be coming up soon, so sit tight. So, little nightmares. After having a dream about a geisha lady, you wake up in a suitcase and travel through the Maw a mostly underwater ship island thing, and as you uncover what it is, the name begins to make sense. You first enter a prison for children that is being run by the janitor, a long-armed blind man. There is also a skinny tall guy who killed himself, but that's probably not important and totally won't be relevant later in the video. There is a play area, a crib area, and a cafeteria area. When first entering this area, you climb up a rope made of tied-together blankets, which, again, is a common trope, used from stories of brides running away or royalty breaking free from a castle. It's fairy tale stuff, it's a makeshift rope. And being that there is little to nothing between the game's starting point and here, I believe this immediately implies that Six, our protagonist with a mysterious name and a mysterious face, was once a part of this, being taken care of in this prison before escaping. But now she goes back, as she has no other choice but to face these horrors to truly escape the Maw. Soon she becomes painfully hungry and scarfs down a piece of bread. This is important for later. We continue the escape and find yourself in a powerful room. Powerful as in emotionally powerful. It's a room full of shoes, nothing but shoes, and considering that this area is a prison full of malnourished children, this room of shoes seems to imply a sort of concentration camp vibe. The Holocaust in World War II gave us many images that showcase the evil humans are capable of, but some of the most breathtaking and award-winning, I might add, are photographs of the shoes. I mean, what do you do with the clothes of so many people, especially the more valuable or harder to destroy shoes? Well, you just stack them, store them in a room, much like here. So right away, we not only get the message of a concentration camp vibe, but perhaps even some sort of genocide going down. As we escape the prison, we see that the janitor is wrapping up the children's now dead bodies into body bags and sending them away on meat hooks. But to where? Where? Well, where do meat hooks go? To the butchers, of course. Boxes upon boxes of body bags lead to a bloody path up to the kitchen. Clearly, the children are being cooked up and even turned into sausages. Eating children is nothing new in horror stories. It's actually a fairly common trope in fairy tales, such as Hansel and Gretel, and numerous others that people haven't heard about because they are too dark for today's standards. But what is new here is that the Ma is apparently a huge restaurant for fat and ugly people. Kinda gives a Miyazaki spirited away kind of vibe. And judging by the cruise ship they come in on, and the more posh attire they find themselves in, and the uh, high-class orgy room, it's implied that they are all rich and gluttonous. 
The Ma's name now is clear, as Ma is another word for a huge voracious mouth. These posh flabs come into the Ma in mass to gorge themselves on food, including the flesh of children. Because that happens to be illegal and very much frowned upon in society. So if they want to do that, they have to go to this hidden ship island thing. Kind of like that one movie, Pirates Band of Misfits, where the rich and royal people want to eat critically endangered animals into extinction. But because that's illegal, they have to do it on a ship outside of legal jurisdiction. The Maw is the same idea, but a lot more twisted. On the way to the restaurant, you see the geisha lady watching them come into the restaurant. Her posture and location immediately implies a position of power. And considering that she is the only person here visibly of Japanese origin, and the restaurant is Japanese-themed in terms of decor, the connection is clear. She's in charge here. She organized the whole thing. But why? Well, as most theories go, you will notice that besides this time, the other times you see the geisha lady, she is brushing her hair. She also happens to be the only person besides the children who isn't grotesque looking. And every mirror in the game save one is broken in some way. And that one still intact mirror happens to be the only thing that works as a weapon against her. Also, considering the other fairy tale inspirations for the story, it's safe to say that this is a Snow White situation. The geisha lady is beautiful. The only beautiful one here, even. But even then, she is unhappy with her looks. So she breaks every mirror and even wears a mask. And you'll notice that the cooks are wearing masks too, as they reach underneath them to scratch. And even the janitor is wearing a mask. The only reason he seems to be blind is because the mask has fallen or melted down over his eyes. The geisha lady made her employees look significantly uglier than her. And she gets pleasure from making the rich and powerful of the world ugly too. But why feed them children? Maybe that's the only way to get these fat farts to bother coming to this restaurant in the middle of the ocean. Offer something that they can't get anywhere else. Maybe children really are just that tasty. Or maybe it's because children are innocent. Children are adorable, pure, and beautiful. Well, when you ignore all the germs. The geisha lady can't compete with that. So she hates children hates them for daring to be better looking than her. These children are just little nightmares. So she has them kidnapped and killed in mass quantities. And what better thing to do with so many dead bodies than feed them to rich creeps? Hmm. Or maybe there is something even more sinister going down. We'll get to that, but first more story. As the common theories go, she eventually has a child of her own. And judging by the pictures of a little girl in yellow all around and in the geisha lady's abode, the implication is clear. Six is her daughter. And being her daughter would explain why Six just happens to know exactly where to go to get to the ladies' quarters. Exactly get through this big, confusing maze that is the Maw. She's seen it all before, and as we see in the concept art for the game, she may have even worked here, helping out, specifically helping this mass bathe, hence the raincoat. And notably, alongside these pictures in the geisha lady's abode, there is another interesting one, with the geisha lady standing beside four other people. They appear to have normal looking proportions, but this may have been at the very start of the Ma, a sort of commemorative photo at the grand opening, before the geisha lady snapped. So who are these other four? Well, they must be the employees at the Ma, clearly. So perhaps they are the four that we see. The two chefs, the janitor, and... Oh, wait, that's three. And before you say it, no, this fourth figure is not the weird water beast that lives at the bottom of the mall. Because this thing was made for the DLC, and the developers claimed that they weren't planning on making DLC at first. But the fans of the game wanted more story, wanted more things to be explained, so they went ahead and made some DLC. Meaning at the time of conception, this photograph with four other figures has to be of figures present in the main game. So it is also notable to ask, if the geisha lady is Six's mother, then who is the father? Probably this other mysterious silhouette. But over time, the geisha lady twisted and snapped and twisted the forms of her workers and even caused them to wear ugly masks on top of that. And eventually, she just couldn't stand the thought that her daughter would grow up and be even more beautiful than she is. So she sent her daughter away to join the rest of the children in the prison. This, understandably, would greatly upset her father, the fourth figure. So perhaps he is the man we see at the beginning who took his own life, notably by hanging himself from this 
very tiny chair. I mean, it's big compared to Six, who is very tiny herself, but if this man were to just sit in this chair, well, the chair would probably slide right up his butt. It's very strange. A lot of proportions in this game are weird, but back to the main point. Since Six knows her way around, she escapes from the prison her mother sent her to, and seeks revenge on her mother and even the whole maw. She plows through the five areas, five levels, five little nightmares, and eats her mother's soul, gaining her powers, and thus becomes the sixth's little nightmare. Hence her name, Six. But wait, wait, hang on. Eats her mother's soul? What's going on? Well, remember that bread thing she ate at the beginning? After that, the next thing she eats is a bit of meat, and then a rat? though she leaves most of it behind. Perhaps she only absorbed its soul, too. And then a gnome! Oh, gnome! These gnomes are little creatures that pose no threat to you, and other times you hug them. They help you out. So by the time you eat one, it's very sad and scary. And then she bites hard at her mother's neck, killing her and absorbing her soul to steal her powers, which she then uses to kill all of the guests in the maw and finally escape. But still, she steals her soul? She really is a little nightmare. Though this also begs the question, why does her mother have these strange ghostly powers, and what's with the soul stealing in general? Well, by answering those questions, we also cover a key theme in this game, cannibalism. I mentioned earlier that this game borrows heavily from fairy tales, and this is also true of cannibalism, the act of eating someone of your own species, in this case, humans eating humans. There is something much more twisted about eating someone rather than just killing someone. It's one thing to murder a person, but to murder and then consume, or even murder by consuming them is... Ugh. And the Brothers Grimm, the authors of most classic fairy tales, knew this. That's why they and many other fairy tale authors included it. In fact, many fairy tales that you know originally had cannibalism in them too. Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, Little Red Riding Hood, and even the original Cinderella implies it at one point. And many fairy tales that aren't well known are unknown because they are too dark and too gruesome for today's standards, as they prominently feature cannibalism. Tales such as The Robber Bridegroom, The Juniper Tree, Sun, Moon, and Talia, and many, many more. And according to Francisco Vaz da Silva, a fairy tale expert and symbolic anthropologist at the University Institute of Lisbon, the act of cannibalism in fairy tales is often supernatural in nature, usually involving ogres, witches, and the metaphor physical, which connotates the idea of absorbing the essence of someone. Much like in Native American mythology in eating the hearts of deer to gain their strength, oftentimes an older woman eats a child as a means to gain back her youth. She absorbs their essence. Cannibalism is also used to spell out the pure voraciousness of death. Death hungers for all souls. Cannibalism is often a metaphor for gruesomely dying, and through regurgitation, you can be reborn. Cannibalism connotes passage and transubstantiation, death and renovation, and encodes reflections on feminine power and kin entanglements. Now, not only does all this cannibalism make a bit of sense, it also explains the maw as a whole. The definition of maw is the jaws or throat of a voracious animal, or the mouth or gullet of a greedy person. In a way, this maw is death, consuming all of those who enter. After all, its official description is this. The maw arrives every year, always at the same time but never in the same place. It creeps and crawls and buries its claws deep beneath the glistening water. And there it sits in vast silence, waiting. Soon after, they start to arrive. The guests. The monstrous, sweating, hungry guests. All seems bursting, bodies bulging, eyes dead with boredom. They shuffle up to the gangway and into the mouth of the maw. And then, they are no more for none of those that enter have ever returned to tell the tale. At least, not yet. The guests aren't coming in to dine at a fancy restaurant and leave. They are coming in to cannibalistically gorge themselves and die. But why and how? Well, come to think of it, we never actually see them die besides at the hands of Six. 
Could this also be insinuating that this soul-absorbing power is how they died previously to, at the will of the geisha lady? But then, for what purpose? Well, that synopsis on cannibalism should have spelled it out for you. The geisha lady wants to remain beautiful and be the most beautiful and possibly immortal person in existence. And children are beautiful, innocent, and pure. So, clearly, it is best to absorb the souls, the essence, the livelihood from children. But there are so, so many children, and because they are so beautiful and pure, the geisha lady cannot stand to even look at them. So why not apply an ugly middleman? Feed multiple children to each voracious glutton. By eating them, they gain the child's soul or essence, and in turn, the geisha lady steals that from the gluttonous guests. Seems like an excellent scheme, no? And it's one that would fit right into a horror fairy tale. Hence all the marketing involving relive your childhood fears and such. And being a fairy tale also excuses powers in general, as fairy tales typically don't go into the backstories of the witches. They just state that they are evil witches with powerful magic. So the ghostly powers of the geisha lady are there both because of her long-lasting near-immortal life and because she is equivalent to a fairy tale witch. But what do you think? Does that sound like a plausible purpose for the Ma, or is it just another theory to throw into the pile? And what do you think this upcoming Little Nightmares DLC will bring to the story? Let me know down below, and please remember to never stop using your noggin.